the first time in a long time, we want to extend a special welcome to you. And for those of you joining us online, we are so glad that you are a part of us, even if it's at a little bit of a distance this morning. Uh, just a few things to uh, make you aware of. One, if you're visiting with us new here for the first time, there are restrooms out either side of these doors here. Always important to know where those are. And uh, two, I wanted to uh, offer just a word of thanks to so many of you that have continued to give faithfully and generously uh, over these last several months. It makes such a difference as we continue to be one church in multiple places. And while that will likely continue for some time, we want you to know that your gifts make this ministry, this church, possible. That we believe as a church that we exist to embrace brokenness and champion wholeness in and through Jesus Christ. And whether that happens in this room together or online or throughout our community, it's your generosity that makes that possible. Uh, so we are grateful for that. Uh, you can always give uh, here in person. There are giving boxes on your way out the door. You can give online through your bank or through the mail. Uh, but please just know that we use those gifts wisely and well to continue our mission of ministry in the world. Here in uh, just a little bit, speaking of COVID, because how can we not speak of COVID right now? Uh, speaking of COVID, I'll be able to share with you a little bit later in the service. We have a COVID response team made up of representatives from several of our leadership teams in the church, as well as medical professionals in the community. And I'll be able to share with you more uh, about some of the next steps and the plans that they are beginning to put in place for the fall. 
Uh, so I'll get to share with you uh, a little bit later in the service about what's next for us or what we can expect together this fall. Uh, but undoubtedly, uh, COVID continues to be present in our community to grow uh, its presence in our community. And that continues to have impact, uh, to impact us individually. We have members of our church family that are currently uh, battling the virus right now. We have, uh, they've not been here in person, so there, there's not been an exposure issue, but we have members of our church family that are sick with it right now. It's impacting uh, our students, our teachers, our community in broad ways. And so we wanna be mindful of that. One of our core values as a church is being people who speak truth. And so we want to create space where we can do that, where we can wrestle with that honestly together. So as an act of worship this morning, I'd like for us to pause and pray together. We're talking about prayer this morning, the Lord's Prayer, in fact, but I want us to continue in worship first and foremost by praying together for one another, for our community, and for our way forward together. Will you join me as we pray? God, we come together this morning grateful for this time and this place. Whether we are here in this room or watching from far, we are grateful uh, to have the opportunity to worship you freely, to speak about you freely. What a privilege and blessing that is. Uh, and we just ask that you would continue to remind us of the gift that it is and to not take that for granted. We pray, we, we pray. We come to you, Lord, looking to meet you in this place and for you to meet us in the seasons that we face. We're all facing unique challenges, unique opportunities, uh, unique obstacles in the midst of our life. But we as a community, we as a country, we as uh, a world are facing this new development of a virus. And while we think about it, while we experience it um, in different ways, we are impacted by it, all of us. And so we would just ask uh, that you would meet us in the midst of that that you would help us to be salt and light, that you would help us to be image bearers of your goodness and grace in the world, that we may be people uh, of grace, of compassion, of truth and care. We pray for those in our community who are walking through illness right now because of this. We pray for our schools, for our children, for our teachers, for our administrators, for our leaders trying to make difficult decisions, to do well by one another and to teach kids well. We pray for our parents who are impacted uh, because of this, for our workplaces, just for our broader community. We would ask that you give us all a measure of endurance, of grace, of care, of peace, of patience, and that we just pray for a miracle for the removal of this. We pray for our doctors and healthcare workers. We pray for our scientists and researchers that we may just continue to learn, that we may bring the best of who we are so that we may find a solution to bring about the end of this pandemic, to bring about the end of this concern, that we may, going forward, uh, find a more measure of normalcy and of wholeness. But until that time, comes. May you help us as your followers be people of grace, be people of salt, and be people of light. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and worship.
those words God they can just penetrate our hearts this morning God that we would just strive to magnify you in all areas of our lives in everything we do God in our worship as we go to our jobs every day in our families in our homes God just be glorified be magnified in everything that we're doing Thank you so much for your presence in this place. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Glad you're here. Glad you're joining us today. We are continuing our journey through Matthew's gospel in our series, God with us. Um, if you've been here in this journey so far, if you let me say if you haven't, you can always go back online and catch up on uh, where we've been so far in this journey. But uh, we've talked from the very beginning, Matthew, uh, if he could impress upon us one dimension, one part of Jesus' identity, it would be that Jesus is the king. He is Christ the King. And so much of Matthew's gospel is interested in telling us just what kind of king he is. And so we talk about very early on in the first chapter of the gospel, Jesus receives his kingly name. His personal name is Yeshua, Jesus. But his kingly name is Emmanuel, God with us. That that is at the very nature and soul of who Jesus is. And so today, I'm excited. We're working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. We've been here for a few weeks. We've got a couple weeks left, and then we'll continue on into the broader movement of Jesus' gospel. But today, we'll be talking about prayer, specifically the Lord's Prayer, arguably the most famous and well-known Christian prayer uh, in history. And so if you've got a copy of Scripture, let me go ahead and invite you to turn or swipe over to Matthew chapter 6, which is where the Lord's Prayer is found. And we'll be talking about prayer um, today. I, I want us to look at uh, some broad uh, insights, I think, that the Lord's Prayer gives us. We'll talk about prayer as a practice broadly. And then there's uh, one element of the Lord's Prayer I want to draw our attention to. We could spend an entire month just walking through the Lord's Prayer alone, but so I just wanted to pick out one element uh, for us to look at maybe kind of as a model of how we can use the prayer um, as a growth tool in our own life. So we'll kind of move through those elements today. As you're turning over, though, let me just say a brief word. I I mentioned this earlier in the service, um, just about our COVID response team. We've been so very fortunate that we've had representatives on this team from uh, the staff, our personnel team, our finance team, our shepherding council, as well as uh, two medical professionals in our community, and they've been meeting every other week uh, for the last several months, continuing to monitor the situation. And so one of their big goals for some time now has been to develop a plan for the fall, uh, a framework to help us all know, uh, kind of to organize ourselves in uh, how we gather, what modifications, if any, we have, and, and how we do that. And so uh, that is about finalized, and uh, we'll be able to share that with you the first part of this week. Uh, so you'll see that online and on social media. Um, you can also, we'll get that by email. Let me just mention this in passing too, that uh, if you've just been joining us for the first time or over the last few months uh, and want to be a part of those emails and get a little more connected to our church community, if you go to our website, www.kcc.church and scroll down a little ways, you'll see there's a link to KC Online. Click that link, sign up, that will get you connected to our church portal and you'll start receiving emails from me. It's going to be one of the greatest days in your life when you get that first email from me. I'll work really hard on those. They're pretty good emails if I do say so myself, but no. Um, 
But if you aren't getting those emails, we'd love for you to be connected and to be receiving those emails, so please do get connected there. Uh, I will tell you, one of the decisions that the team made, I won't go into the specifics today, um, we're still finalizing some things as well, but one of the decisions that the team did for simplicity's sake was they were committed to wanting to have our response in some way be anchored to what's happening in our community. That they wanted it to be very community focused, community specific. If things are going well, we want to uh, be reflected of that in our ministry and gathering. If we have a, a larger presence in the community, we want to be reflected of that as well. And so the framework, which is very unique to our church life, uh, they did make the decision that our framework will mirror the framework of the school system. So that just as the school system has a multi-tiered plan based upon the prevalence of the virus in our community, so too will our fall 2020 plan. There's lots of reasons for that. We'll talk more about that. Um, you'll get a lot more information about what to expect, but not only did we feel like that was a good core value to say we want a very community-specific plan, but let me also say this, that um, whether we, uh, regardless of our personal thoughts or feelings about the school system's plan, it's their plan. And so as the virus becomes more prevalent in active cases in the community, it directly impacts our schools. So that means it directly impacts our students, our teachers, our administrators, but it also directly impacts our parents, our families, our workplaces, and our employers. And so we view ourselves as a church, as a community partner. And so it's important to me personally but I think to us more broadly, that we want to be good stewards of our own time and ministry and be doing what we can, not only to have as much normalcy as possible, but also we want to do what we can to make sure that we are helping our kids stay in school and our parents stay at work. And so that is part of the motivation behind what we will be doing going forward as a church. So you'll hear a lot more about that. We'd be glad to talk to you about that. The team will be available to talk about it. You'll get a really great email. I've been working on it. I'm really proud of this one. No, but you'll get some emails from us and communications as well as some videos over the next few days um, as we continue to chart our way forward. But I wanted to share some of those convictions and commitments with you that we really do view ourselves as a community partner. And so we believe, of course, what we do and how we gather as a church is incredibly important, but we wanna do that well and we wanna do it wisely so that we are helping to do what we can to spread out the spread of the virus in our community going forward. So we'll talk to you more about that in the days ahead. Now, enough with COVID, right? Let's have a little COVID break and uh, talk about prayer. I'm excited actually for a couple reasons uh, to talk to you about this. Um, and let me just one last thing before we jump in and I'll read for us Matthew 6. Um, prayer is, let me preface everything that we're about to walk through by saying this. Prayer is something that is both, I think, learned best by both studying it and by practicing it. And so prayer is not something that we can just read about or talk about or think about and cultivate in a transformative way within us. Likewise, if all we do is to pray the very first ways that we were taught to pray, we're limiting ourselves by the great richness and breadth that our broad 2,000 years of Christian tradition has to offer us. And so we want to be the sort of folks and the kind of community that approaches prayer from both ends. We want to learn, we want to grow, we want to study. There are things we can be taught about prayer, but we also want to be practitioners of prayer. And so if you're looking for a place to do that, prayer is something I think that honestly we learn best from others, praying with people, being mentored by people. One of the great gifts of our church is we have a shepherding council that is charged not only with helping uh, manage the vision of the church, but one of their primary tasks is to be leaders of prayer in our community. And so they right now offer two gatherings for prayer that you can join throughout the week on Tuesday mornings and Thursday nights. And if you're looking for a place, particularly after our conversation today, if you're looking for a place to workshop your prayer, to be mentored in prayer, to have seasoned people of prayer, 
help you in your own journey, that's a great place to start. And I would love to talk to you more about that or help you get connected with that going forward. So just put that away and know that in the back of your mind, you've got people here in this community that would love to walk with you in that journey with prayer. Now, that's enough preface material. If you've got a copy of scripture, uh, let's be uh, in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. I'll read for us. Um, you know what? Let me, we'll start, let me stop us at 13, and then uh, if we've got some time, we'll continue on to finish, well, you know what, let's get crazy. Let's go through 18, and then we'll, um, we'll uh, pick up a little bit more after that. All right, so this is uh, Jesus speaking, Sermon on the Mount, midway through Matthew 6, starting in verse 5. It says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask it. Pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come soon, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, then no one will notice that you're fasting except your Father, who knows what you do in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Jesus uh, picks up prayer one more time towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Uh, if we don't make our way there by the end of our time today, I just want to mention that to you and encourage you to pick that back up where he uh, provides a variation on a theme, so to speak, where he takes much of what he says here in chapter 6 and expounds upon it a little bit further. Um, this morning, like I said, I want us to focus primarily on the Lord's Prayer itself, which is verses 9 through 13. So we'll come back to that here in a moment, but there's a few things I want to touch on, a few loose ends that I want to um, gently tie together for us so that they don't just sit there bugging you the whole time. So uh, the first is, let's just get the big one out of the way. What is he talking about there at the end? If I don't forgive people, I'm not going to be forgiven. What's this, right? I feel like I've missed this along the way, right? This is pretty important news, pretty big news. What is he talking about there? What about this once saved, always saved? What about this grace that comes freely given? This seems conditional in some way, right? This seems troublesome in a way, right? Well, it's true. And uh, this is where I got to sort of bury the lead a little bit. I need you to put an asterisk by this. I need you to mark this and remember this place in this moment uh, because we're going to have to come back to it. We're not going to address that today. Uh, we're not going to have a nice, neat answer to that today because on the face of it, Jesus means what he says, right? There's no double back flip uh, triple axle sow cow experience, right? That I can just help us jump through to say, oh, he didn't really mean it. No, you know? But part of what's happening in Matthew's gospel, and this is what we will pick up after the Sermon on the Mount, and this is why Jesus begins to introduce this vision of the world, is that Jesus is very convinced that what we do to one another, we are in effect doing to God. And so it is in Matthew's gospel, for instance, where we get that beautiful passage, Matthew 25, I was naked and you clothed me. 
I was hungry and you fed me. I was in prison and you visited me. Lord, Lord, we say, when did we do that? When you did it to the least of these brothers of mine, you did it unto me. That in Matthew's gospel, Jesus has a world vision that the kingdom of God is breaking into the world. That forgiveness is possible here. Transformation is possible here and now. But what we do to one another, to these other people who also bear the image of God, we are doing to God. And so there is an element, I believe, and we'll again address this because this is not uh, the last time that Jesus picks on this theme of forgiveness and redemption, but that there's an element here, I believe, that Jesus begins to say, you can experience forgiveness. The kingdom comes to you. Salvation comes to you. Yes, it is a gift freely given. But the fullness of the transformation made possible by God's forgiveness will be limited if you do not allow it to transform your own forgiveness for other people. That the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, the salvation of God has the power to transform our own capacity to forgive. To grant mercy, to give grace. And if we don't do that, we are limiting the power of God's forgiveness. Maybe not our salvation, but man, we are robbing ourselves in the process. So we'll talk more about that, but I didn't want to simply read that and then pass on by and say, no problem, y'all, right? See you later. But we'll come back to that because Jesus actually develops a lot of this in the coming chapters of Matthew's gospel in a pretty beautiful way. The second thing I just want to mention in passing, this is where we get the, our early verses 5, 6, and 7, uh, famously, uh, you know, to go into your prayer closet to go and pray in private comes from these passages and from what we know from our ancient archaeologists that most ancient houses were very small, as you might expect, but that there was usually uh, one room in the house right at the center of the building that was a bit of a pantry. It was very small, but it was about the only room in the house that didn't have windows, that didn't have anything but a door. It was the one place in an ancient home that you could have true privacy. And that's what Jesus seems to be saying here, that my preference for you would be that you go hide away in the pantry in the dark to pray rather than risk praying on the street, rather than risk you letting it be about something else. And this gets for us to the heart of Jesus' motivation for prayer. Right? We don't need to pray because God is somehow needing information. He says, no, God knows what you need. Right? But rather, he says, prayer is about us entering into the presence of God. It is about, as we talked about last week, that pathway, that two-way street between our outer world and our inner world. Jesus is very wisely saying, look, what happens in the outer world matters to the inner world and vice versa, but that his fundamental concern with our prayer life is the transformation that can take place in the inner world. And so if we get caught up by how we look when we pray, who we pray in front of when we pray, the words we use, how we sound when we pray, if we get lost in our prayer life here in the outer world, then we never can travel into that intimate presence with God in our inner world for that transformation that God is looking to enact. That doesn't mean public prayer is bad, doesn't mean it's not impossible, but it means you have to be extra careful, right? That Jesus is saying to start off with, start in the dark, start in private, do everything you can to remove distraction, but to remove temptation. That prayer can be about anything else but that encounter with God. If you have to go sit on the floor in the dark, it is better for you than to stand up here on a platform or at Christmas dinner or wherever it may be. It is better for you to do it in the dark than to do it here and be tempted to think that the goodness or the power of your prayer is rooted in what other people think. 
And so that is the motivation leading up to this. The disciples, remember, are the ones moving us along through the story. So it's the disciples asking us, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so what Jesus gives here, as we're now making our way to the Lord's Prayer itself, what Jesus is giving us here is this is the defining prayer of the followers of Jesus. They say, teach us to pray as you would pray. Teach us, Rabbi, let us follow in your steps. Teach us to pray as you would. How can we be identified as your followers? What do your prayers look like? And he says, it looks just like this. Now, there's three elements for us looking at the Lord's Prayer itself, verses 9 through 13. There's three elements I want us to pay attention to this morning. Because what the Lord's Prayer does, and I think this is a good model for our broader prayer life. We'll talk here in a minute about all the different forms of prayer. But Jesus is not too concerned with the form, right? Do you notice some things that are missing here? He doesn't tell us when to pray. He doesn't tell us how often to pray. He doesn't even tell us exactly where we have to. He says, just make sure you're removing yourselves from these distractions. Jesus is not too interested in the form of our prayer, but rather the substance. And the substance of the Lord's Prayer, of the model prayer for us, hits on at least three things. It first reminds us who we are and who God is. It recenters our overarching priority, and it grounds us in the specifics of our life, okay? It reminds us who we are and who God is. It reorients our priorities, and it reminds us that God is present in our daily life. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. So, uh, Let's look at verse 9. Pray like this, Jesus says, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. The Lord's Prayer has a really basic structure, right? There are three petitions. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. Three points of focus, first and foremost, on God first. Then there are three places of concern in our own life. Give us the food we need. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Lead us not into temptation. And they are mediated, they are transitioned between a simple idea, a simple prayer of saying, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. That's it. That's the structure of the Lord's Prayer. We go from focusing on God to focusing on the kingdom coming to earth, to focusing on our lives here on earth. That's the basic transition here. But it starts with our Father. Those two simple words begin our prayer life by reorienting our relationship to God. Let me tell you what I mean. As many of you know, we've got two boys, four, almost four and almost two. Right now, we're working with our oldest one, Griffin. Um, he's getting to that age, or really, I should say his younger brother is getting to the age where uh, Joel, our, our youngest, he's beginning to have preferences. And this is shocking and traumatic for Griffin, that his younger brother would actually prefer to do something that Griffin doesn't want to do, or that his younger brother might want to eat something that Griffin doesn't want to eat. This is mind-blowing to him, that Griffin, as the oldest, can't just do or watch or eat whatever he wants, right? But that his little brother may actually get to pick a show, right? So we've been working through a lot of this of reminding Griffin that just because he asks for something or wants something, he, uh, he doesn't always get it, right? This is a tough lesson for all of us. Some of us are still learning that lesson, right? But uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago, he's, Griffin's also in this really sweet stage where he's... Um, beginning to kind of parrot or mimic a lot of things. And so it's really sweet for me right, as his dad. You know, this is the phase where I'll come home and he's walking through the house and my shoes and, you know, a lot of cool stuff like that. He's mimicking what's going on. But as you can imagine, these two developments in his life are on a collision course, right? You see where this is going. So often now I find that Griffin will say back to me things that I have said to him, right? He will mimic 
my parenting, right? This is the best, particularly when he tries to parent his younger brother. Oh, no, 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 Joel. Do not climb up there. No, 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 right? He'll begin to parent his younger brother. But a few, uh, a few weeks ago, um, we were driving back from being out. Some friends had gone for the evening and had invited us over to use their pool while we were gone. And so we had a great time and we were loading up the car. I was in the front of the minivan. Griffin had just gotten buckled in and was asking to go home and play outside. I said, no, buddy, we've got to go home. We've got to get dressed and get ready for bed. He said, but I want to play outside, dad. Sorry, buddy. It's late. We've had a great time. You've been great. We've got to go home. It's time for bed. He said, Oh, no, Dad, you don't get to decide. <laughs> Screech, right? So, so I look back, right? Everything, like, slows down, right, in that moment, right? Your blood pressure goes up, all this sort of stuff. You're in slow motion, right? I turn around, and, you know, as I'm turning, you do the, what did you say? Like, what just happened? Right? It turns around, and he says it again. He says, oh, no, Dad, you don't get to decide, But I look back, right? I look at him in that moment, and he's just sitting in his car seat in the back, reading a book, just, oh, no, Dad, you don't get to decide, right? No hint of malice, right? No hint of rebellion in him, nothing in his tone about that. But he is expressing in that moment, right? I don't want to do that. And sometimes when Dad tells me no. This is how he tells me no. So I'll just say that back to Dad, right? That's what he's doing in that moment. He's not angry. He's not trying to hurt me. He's not being disrespectful. But he knows that when I tell him no, sometimes I have to tell him, no, Griffin, you don't always get to decide. Well, so in that moment, right, (laughs) you have to catch your breath for a second. But in that moment, at the heart of that interaction with my son, wasn't rebellion or disrespect. At the heart of that interaction was what? Confusion. That Griffin, my son, was confused about who he was and who I was in that moment. That in that moment, I, as his father, as his parent, was making a decision. I was the dictator in that moment, right? I was all powerful and saying, no, buddy, it's bedtime. And in that moment, he was confused, right? He thought he could use the same words, the same phrase, the same logic to interact and change my mind, to change the course of the evening. It wasn't out of malice or meanness or rebellion, right? There's no hint of anger. He was just trying it on, so to speak. He said, no, buddy, we can't speak that way, right? There's a difference in our relationship here. And he had to be reminded who he was in that moment as my three-year-old son and who I was as his father, right? Well, in much the same way, good prayer for us, regardless of the form that it takes, good prayer for us begins with our father, It puts us in right relationship. It reminds us who we are and who God is. With me? That prayer for us should, time after time, begin from a place of saying, God, I am your child and you are my father. But I am also me and you are also you. You are God and I am not. Part one of the model prayer. Part two, it orients our values and our expectations. The Lord's prayer begins with our Father, which by the way, not only is a recognition of our intimate relationship, this father-child intimacy that exists, but it also is in the plural. It's not my Father, it's our Father. It reminds us that also who I am is I am one of many children to God. Sometimes when you're praying those prayers of righteous vengeance, right? It's a good reminder too that who you're praying for or praying against or praying through at the time also is sitting there saying our Father. But so it reminds us who we are in relationship to God and then it moves us second into 
a understanding or a remembering of our ultimate priority. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let me remember your holiness, right? And then what do we see? May your kingdom come soon. That my first request, beyond honoring and remembering your holiness, your goodness, your power, is to ask for what? Not that my kingdom come, not that my needs be met, we'll get to those in a minute, but to say, our Father, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. That it reminds us in that moment We are invited and charged and empowered to be about the work of our Father. We are invited into the family business of redemption and transformation in the world. And that prayer, good prayer, Jesus' prayer, begins always with remembering that, right? And so he continues, may your kingdom come May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We get to that transition point. So good prayer, Jesus' model prayer for us, reminds us who we are and who God is. It reminds us of our ultimate priority, which is the coming of God's kingdom, his transformation and redemption of the world. And then, just as importantly, but in the right order, we pray May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins. Don't let us yield to temptation. This is really easy, I think, for us to pass through or pass over because we we take it for granted, right? That many of us were taught or learned or just kind of picked up on our own that by default, many of us come to prayer. If we come to prayer at all, we come to prayer backwards. We come to prayer saying, I know God, it's been a little while, but things have gotten pretty rough. I know it's been a little while, God, but I'm in a tight spot. I've got some needs, and that in and of itself isn't wrong. Hear me when we say that, right? That's a beautiful part of this, that Jesus is not saying our prayer needs to simply be lip service to God. It needs to somehow be affirming to God and nothing else. But what Jesus tells us here is to say, look, God is deeply interested in your life. God is deeply interested in you having enough bread to make it through the day. He's deeply interested in the inner work of your heart and the forgiveness and the restoration of your relationships that needs to take place. God is deeply interested in your future that you avoid the temptation of the evil one, right? Going back to Jesus' temptation earlier in the gospel. God is deeply interested in that and he wants us to bring that to him. He knows what we need, but there is something good and right like any child going to their father saying, Father, I need this. There is something that I need that you have and there is something deeply powerful about that. But Jesus says, be careful to get to that in the right way. You've got to remember who God is, that God is there as a loving father. God is not there as a slot machine that you just pull and say, budget's looking really tight. God, ka-ching, help us out. Let's see what comes out, right? God is not just a prayer, spiritual, cosmic ATM, to just go in, dial in, make a request, and hope it comes out, hope that there's enough in the checking account to spit out the right amount of cash. Jesus says we deprive ourselves if we don't first come to God, remembering that God loves us like a good father. We miss out and deprive ourselves if we come to God, our Father, not remembering that God is redeeming the world while we slept. And that God has invited us to use all that we are and all that we have to be a part of it. And then we can come to God saying, this is what I'm facing, Dad. This is what I need, Papa. This is what I'm struggling with. Can you help me out? And that each of those steps, God is deeply interested in being a part of it. 
And so prayer is for us grounded in that substance. The form that it can take, the amount of prayer we could talk about. Most of us know uh, what's often referred to as intercessory prayer, praying for other people, not unlike what we did this morning, right? The start of the service. That is one of the deep, old, rich traditions where we intercede on the behalf of others in our community, in our schools, people that are sick, people that are struggling. That is good, right prayer. But there's more to prayer than that. There's listening prayer. There's centering prayer. There's scripture-based Lectio Divina prayer. There's private prayer. There's corporate prayer. There's all kinds of prayer that the form prayer takes is unique and powerful like tools in a tool belt. But the substance at the heart of it, the true transformation of prayer is rooted in the belief that God fathers us and loves us that God's redeeming the world and invites us into that work, and that God is deeply interested in the specifics of our life and wants to see good life happen. That at the root of true transformative prayer, all three of those things are present. So let me give you one last example as we wrap up this morning, one, a quick little story for us. Um, Here's my, my challenge for you this week, and then I'll give you an example of it, so a couple minutes. Um, so my challenge for you this week, if, for many of us, prayer is something that is scary because there's really not much in our life that's like it. You can't lean on this experience you have in your workplace. You can't lean on this experience that you have from your childhood or any other thing. Prayer is wholly unique, just like our relationship with God is wholly unique. And so if you've never prayed before or you haven't prayed in a long time and you're afraid that it's going to feel awkward, good news, it will feel awkward. You're right. This is a new experience. But here is the good news that your Father, who is both in heaven and on earth, loves you and longs to speak with you. And remember that it is our God who is a God who does what? Who creates by speaking who Jesus, John's gospel says, is the word made flesh. Our God loves to talk and is deeply interested in talking to you. The question is, can we do what we need to do to remove the distraction, to remove the formality, to remove the performance, to go to our little prayer closet and say, Abba, Father, it's me. Thank you for fathering me. <laughs> Remind me that you are God and I am not and let me rest in that. Remind me that you are alive and well and at work in the world and I can trust your work and enter into my life in these ways. Help me to make it through. Help me to become who you've made me to be. That's the power of prayer. So here's my challenge for you this week and I'll just give you a brief example of how I've done it in my life this week. My challenge for you this week is to once a day, for the next seven days, read these handful of verses. Read the Lord's Prayer. To find one element of those three that we've talked about. Maybe it's the Our Father. Maybe it's your kingdom come. Maybe it's our daily bread or the forgiveness of our enemies. Take one of those three movements of prayer and offer it to God as a prayer. Maybe it's spoken out loud as you sit with your morning coffee. Maybe it's writing in your journal. Maybe it's sitting at a red light on your way to work. The form is not nearly as important as the inner intention of your heart. But take time this week to read all of the Lord's Prayer, to take one element of the Lord's Prayer and to pray it, and then give yourself three minutes each day to listen. That's it. Three minutes. Read the prayer, pray a part of the prayer, and listen. I, for one, do that part worst of all. That ours is a God who loves us and loves to speak to us, and sometimes I'm too busy to stick around to listen. To say, what do you have to say for me, God, about that forgiveness? What do you have to say to me about healing that father wound? What do you have to say to me 
about remembering your broader kingdom work in the world. So one brief example, and then uh, we'll call it quits this morning. The part this week for me as I was preparing and thinking about this that really stuck out to me was in verse uh, 11. Give us today the food we need. Give us our daily bread. So this is what it looked like for us. I don't know about you, but uh, has anybody else had one of those weeks where uh, you needed the daily bread every day this week? Anybody relate to that? Anybody? Well, so real quick, I'll just tell this story about our um, kind of week of misadventures. We um, had a bit of a challenging week. Everybody's well, we're fine. But I, there's a couple of things that happened this week. Um, so I, many of you know this before, my mom, uh, when I was in high school, was diagnosed with colon cancer, battled it for six years, and then passed away. Uh, but her father also had colon cancer. And so because of that, we, uh, there's a suspicion that my sister and I may have a genetic condition that makes it more likely to do this. So uh, we go get checked. Uh, we do uh, scopes every two years um, to do that. And so I had to do my, my two-year uh, colonoscopy earlier this week. Everything went well. It was fine. Good for two more years. Uh, but I keep telling, I keep asking my doctor when he's going to um, institute a frequent flyer program. And he just won't. I don't know how many of these I have to do before I get a free one, but he won't. He won't go for it. Um, but my, my sister and I and my dad now, too, all see the same doctor. So I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure my family alone paid for this, kid, this guy's kid's college. So I don't know why we didn't get invited to the, um, to the graduation, but uh, we've been very fortunate in that. But so my Monday and Tuesday was really consumed with a lot of not fun stuff which if you've ever had that experience, it's not a fun experience, but you get through it, it's okay. But for me, at least, it's coupled with a lot of anxiety and fear because I'm reminded the reason I'm doing this is there's a chance I have cancer, right? So there's a reason that I have to do this. So the first part of my week was pretty well shot. It just wasn't a lot of fun, right? Joy was great. The boys were great. Took care of me. We go back to this doctor that, I, that we grew up seeing uh, in Franklin, but then on our way back that later that day and Tuesday when I was still in a bit of an anesthesia haze, uh, we were getting some things out of the car and Joy inadvertently uh, hurt her toe really bad. So then she had to go have two um, doctor's appointments and get her big toenail removed um, over the course of this week. Now, she's a trooper. If that had happened to me, I would have been here on a hover round, right? Coming out of here, up on the stage. She's great. She's just walking around over there, no problem. But our week was uh, the express ride on the struggle bus every day, right? Just trying to make it through this week. It was hard and frustrating and difficult for everybody. And thankfully, I was thinking about this. Thankfully, every day I was reminded that at least in one way, I got to be a kid again. That of all the things I needed to do, of all the responsibilities I had, of all of the, you know, I don't know, we couldn't figure out how we were going to change that bandage on her toe, right? We're both sweating. You're trying not to pass out, right, as we're going through that. I mean, from everything about this week, right, I was reminded that I got to be a child of the king. I was reminded that God is working to transform brokenness into wholeness. And I was reminded that God wants to give me daily bread, that God is deeply interested in giving me what literally says a fresh loaf right out of the oven, the best. Now, it's only for today. My personality, my preference is give me the lifetime supply of bread, right? Give me at least enough bread to outpace inflation, God, right? Let me grow the retirement account. Let me secure my future in this way. But God was there ready to give me what I needed for that day. For the day of waiting for it, for the day of the procedure, for the day of getting joy to the doctor, for the day of Nana coming and watching the boys, for the day, for the day, for the day. The Lord's Prayer reminded me that God wanted to speak to my inner life, to remind me that he's my father, 
that he's at work in the world and that he cares about me, that he cares about Joy's toe, that he cares about my health, that he cares about our kids. And that is the kind of prayer that transforms at least me and transforms who I can be in the world. So I'm going to invite our worship band back up. And my invitation to you this week is what I said earlier, to take time uh, to once a day do a pretty simple thing. Read the Lord's Prayer to pray one portion of the Lord's Prayer and to give yourself three minutes, just three minutes, to quietly, privately listen. Maybe you won't hear anything, but if you do, give yourself the benefit of the doubt that our God is a God who loves to speak. Our God is a God who loves us. Our God is a God who cares enough about us to give us fresh bread for the day. That maybe, just maybe, that word you hear in your spirit, that sense of calm or peace you feel after you pray, that encouragement from a friend, that text from the person in your small group, maybe, just maybe, that really is God answering your prayer. Remember who you are and who God is. Remember what God is up to in the world. And remember that God cares about you. To give you food for the journey, healing for your heart, and a pathway into the future. Let's stand together and sing.
privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Don't miss that, right? What a gift that our God is a God who asks that, who invites us, who teaches us the way and says, come and bring it to me. We're so glad that you are here today. If you're joining us online or in person, if you're here in person, uh, again, know that we're so grateful that you're here. Please help us. Remember, uh, one of the things we're asking to do as we leave is that we just kind of take our time and give each other a little space as we leave. If you'd like to have time uh, to talk or catch up, we totally understand. We just ask that you to do that outside and uh, as we kind of uh, clean and make space in the room here going forward. As we get ready to go this week, let me leave you with a few more of Jesus' words on prayer from Matthew 7, uh, 7 through 11. He says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Your par- you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? May you go this week, brothers and sisters, remembering that your good heavenly Father loves you. Allow yourself to be a child in his arms. Remember the work that he is doing in the world and remember that he cares deeply about you, your life, and your future. Go with that knowledge, go with that hope, and go in peace. Amen. Let's go. Let's go. That's an awesome.